Beside me now on the screen is the title of this lecture, written in Chinese characters, three of them, Chinese bi gong yuan, uh, Japanese hikkoen, meaning the brush, pro brush plowed field, or the garden plowed by the brush. Uh, this is a charming poetic conceit, uh, the idea that the brush can plow a garden so that lots of lovely paintings spring up. Um, it's the name given to a famous album, now in the Tokyo National Museum, uh, an album of 60 small paintings attributed to various artists and uh, representing a great many subjects, as we'll see. Uh, two of my lectures, this and another one, which will be GIP 5B, will be devoted to this album and the paintings in it, uh, 30 leaves considered in each of the lectures. And I'll bring in a lot of comparative material to discuss them in some depth. So here we go on Hiko and part one. Here is the Tokyo National Museum. For many years during my stay, my time in Japan, I knew about this album, which was in a private collection, without being able to see it. And then the time came, sometime in the 1980s, when it was acquired by the Tokyo National Museum. And I made an appointment to go there and see it and photograph some of the leaves. The curator of Chinese paintings there at that time was my good friend Minato Nobuyuki, whom I met again at a symposium in Seoul, Korea last year. He and several other Japanese scholars were there with the album waiting for me when I came. It was a hot day, and I remember worrying about, worrying about whether I would drip perspiration onto the album as I leaned over it with my camera. The slides I made then turned out to be very dark, not usable for um, exhibition, for projection. They sat for many years in a box in my study in Berkeley, a box labeled Hikkoen colon Leiden. At that time, they needed to be copied to be lightened. You had to send them out for copying and ask them, please lighten these. I never did that. Uh, finally, anyway, just um, a matter of month, months ago, I brought them back here to Vancouver, where they have been digitized and somewhat lightened by my collaborator, Ran Chatterjee, and fed into my iPhoto library, where I've been able to further doctor them to make them more visible and more, more like their real appearance. Uh, these newly available images then make up the basis for this lecture, along with an old reproduction book that is devoted to this album. Next, please. Hikkoen is also the name of a volume of reproductions published in 1912. Here is the publisher's colophon at the back of the book, dating it to the first era of the Taisho era, which was indeed 1912. The quality of the reproductions in this, for this time especially, is really extraordinary. Uh, fine color type black and whites and color reproductions made I'll talk about in a minute. When we think of what kinds of art books are being published in the West then, uh, it really stands out as quite an achievement. The next please. Here is the English language uh, preface to the volume. They have pages of both English and Japanese. And this tells the history of the, of the album. Uh, here, I'll, I'll read some of it anyway. The original of the following prints is an album titled Hikkoen, long acknowledged to rank very high in the list of classical Chinese paintings. It's in the possession of Marquis Kuroda and is, in one, of his, and is one of his ancient family treasures, being known by tradition to be a trophy of the Korean expedition in the era of Bunroku toward the end of the 16th century. Judging, however, from the fact that one of these pictures bears a seal marked Tenzan, which is identified to be that of Yoshimitsu, the third shogun of the Ashikaga dynasty, who died in the early part of the 15th century, it seems more probable that the collection was made in Japan than it was brought over from Korea in its present condition. The list comprises 60 pieces, works of no less than 49 masters of Sung, Mongol, and Ming dynasties of medieval China, with its boundless variety of subjects and widely different modes and manners of delineation such a collection cannot fail to be of signal importance in investigating the history of different schools and the characters of each ma characteristics of each master, and so for the reference of connoisseurs. It is in view of this that we have attempted the present reproduction of this unique collection by the most generous permission of its distinguished owner, uh, and so on. Okay, um, Shimbi Shouen, 1912. 
The story of the albums coming from Korea is unlikely to be true. There are not paintings of this kind that were collected in Korea so far as available evidence goes. Um, <clears throat> the likelihood that they were brought together in Japan, maybe in the 17th and 18th centuries, uh, is much greater. And in fact, they are a remarkable collection of Chinese paintings of the kind that in China would be considered minor or negligible, but in Japan were treasured. This is, in other words, a wonderful collection of the kinds of Chinese paintings collected early in Japan, the kind that I call Sogenga. Next, please. My first published book, this is the cover of it. Um, actually, it should have been titled Sogenga. That was the title of the original Japanese book on which this one was based. What I did was to write a new English text for a small book that had already been published with a Japanese text and was, as I say, titled Sogenga. But I couldn't have used that title for the English version because the word was unknown. We wouldn't have sold any books. Likewise, Sungyeon Paintings was too, comp too, too technical to a title then. People didn't know about Sungyeon very much. So I had to resort to this awkward title as here, Chinese Paintings, 11th to 14th Centuries. Um, the book was published in 1960, the same year as my Skira book, but some months earlier. So it's really my first book. The job of writing it I took on back when I was in Japan in 1953 to 54 as a Fulbright student. Next, please. Here I am seen with my dealer friend, Mariyama Junkichi, around that time or a few years later. I was approached by a publisher who offered me Nimon N, 20,000 20, yen, to write an English text for it. It was about $50 at that time. I remember blowing the entire Nimon N on a glorious night on the Ginza. Well, anyway, even though it was a modest little book, it was reviewed by Alexander Soper in his journal Artibus Asiae with high praise. He called it the best short introduction to Chinese painting so far written. Um, years later, I did a seminar with students on this subject of Sogenga and held an exhibition. I've already talked about that in an earlier lecture. And lecture 12C was titled Sogenga and devoted to examples of them. I'll use this lecture to show more of them, talk about them in more detail. They still make up a kind of Chinese painting, disinherited, so to speak, by its country of origin, a kind that's still little recognized. I myself stand in the special position of a Chinese painting specialist who spent many years going to Japan, spent a lot of time there, loving the country, speaking the language fairly fluently, circulating constantly among collectors, scholars, and dealers, seeing many thousands of Chinese paintings that weren't accessible to most others. Uh, because I was a collector myself, and because I spoke the language, I say fairly fluently, and had acquired a certain reputation, dealers would show me a lot more paintings than they would have to ordinary scholars. So I can speak now from that special point of view and show pictures that you won't see much elsewhere. Next, please. Uh, last year I published an essay in both English and Chinese translation in this volume, which was published on the occasion of a great exhibition of the Shanghai Museum. The full title was Masterpieces of Ancient Chinese Paintings, colon, Paintings from the Tang to Yuan Dynasties in Japanese and Chinese Collections. Uh, the exhibition was held in the fall of 2010 at the Shanghai Museum and was the first time that old Chinese paintings preserved in Japan were brought back to China for exhibition there. I couldn't go to the exhibition myself, but I wrote a long essay for the catalog and the volume of essays. Um, my essay was titled, Early Chinese Paintings in Japan, colon, An Outsider's View. An outsider, that is, uh, being somebody who's neither Chinese nor Japanese, and who can take a certain more independent point of view than either of the others could, anyway. My essay was printed in both English and a very good Chinese translation. Chinese translation made partly by a woman of the Shanghai Museum and partly, more importantly, by Professor Liu Ping, who teaches at Wellesley College and was once my student. My essay was reprinted in several places. It was much discussed. I wrote from, as I say, a unique position as somebody who had straddled the two cultures and the two collecting traditions, who had spent many years going around Japanese collectors and dealers, seeing and photographing the paintings they owned, and who, who could write then uh, comparatively about the two traditions of collecting and connoisseurship 
in these two very different cultures. Now at last back to Hikoen. But first let me talk about how I was able to get digital images from the copy of this rare volume preserved in the Princeton Rare Book Collection. Uh, it was through the great help of the Princeton doctoral candidate, Michael Hatch, who has been my live-in housemate and helper during two of my recent stays in Berkeley. He was there in the summer of 2010 to study with Pat Berger and to take a summer intensive course in Chinese. And he took on this job through Pat Berger's recommendation. It had great benefit to me. I wrote my essay during that summer, talking with him about it all the time. Uh, we're seen here in this uh, photograph at my 84th birthday party in the house at Inverness that Sarah and her family rent every summer. Um, and the people in it, uh, here we go. In the lower right, smiling with glasses, is Michael Hatch. I'm seated in the middle, of course, looking very old and fat and self-contented <laughs> anyway. And uh, uh, beside me, my two boys, twin boys, Julian to the left in the picture and uh, Benedict on the right. Behind us, reading from the right, Pat Berger, uh, Rick Vinograd behind her, Julia White, uh, Sally Leong, who was a docent who became a collector and a good friend, and behind them, uh, my daughter Sarah with red hair, uh, my granddaughter Miranda, and son-in-law John Sanborn with his uh, mustache and little beard. Okay, they're the whole family. Very happy event. Uh, then next, please. Now, a special feature of the Princeton copy of the Hiko N volume, and a surprise to me, is this inscription in it, dedicating it to no less than Albert Einstein and his wife. Uh, it's written by a certain Jun Ishiwara, unknown to me, and is dated 1922, ten years after the book was published. Next, please. And here is the uh, English language list of paintings in the album, all 60 of them. If you could read the artist's names, which of course you can't hear, they're too small, you'd find that most of them are famous Sung and Ran masters, whose works would be treasured by Chinese collectors as well as the Japanese. But when we look at the paintings themselves individually and closely, as we're going to do, we find that very few of them are likely to be by those great masters. The names, um, that is, are, so the names assigned to them are the names that are typically attached to paintings of certain styles and certain subjects. Pictures of geese are attributed to Hui Chong, pictures of quail to Li Anjung, and so forth. What we'll really find when we look at the paintings are a group of what I call Sogenga, old Chinese paintings of the kind admired and preserved in Japan from early times. Some of them brought back by Buddhist priests who went to China to study, others imported to fill a demand created by these earlier imports, and so forth. Anyway, this is all described in my essay, uh, which I recommend as background reading for these lectures, this essay written for the Shanghai Museum exhibition. The next, please. Uh, there are two prefaces in Japanese, which I put on the screen here. One of them is by a certain Kaneko something, uh, per perhaps a woman who married into the Kuroda family, uh, she writes about the history and the importance of the album, preserved, as I say, in the Marcos Kuroda family for a long time. The other preface is the Japanese preface written by the editors of Shimbi Shoin, the publisher, uh, telling about the ownership of the album, describing the contents, telling why they decided to publish it in this luxury volume. Some of the leaves, as we'll see, are reproduced in color, which in 1912 could be accomplished only by printing them with color wood blocks, multiple color wood blocks, as we'll see. Uh, this flattens the paintings, it eliminates the brushwork, and so forth, but it transmits the general design of the picture pretty well. Uh, color wood block was actually used much later in the PRC in China uh, by publishers such as Zhu, uh, Rongbao Jai uh, as late as the 1980s to reproduce paintings there. Next, please. Here are uh, two pages from the Japanese list of paintings, and I put them on just to note that somebody, maybe Mr. Ishiwara, who presented the volume to Albert Einstein, has written numbers in English by hand above the Japanese titles. Okay, next, please. Here, at last, is Hikoen uh, leaf number one, the cover page and the reproduction. 
Each of the 60 paintings has these two. That is a cover page with a, a, a text printed on it and a reproduction, either in black and white or in color. The text gives the English title and the artist's name plus the dimensions in inches in the English text. In Japanese, they're in sun, Japanese inches. Uh, the Japanese texts are mostly devoted to biographical information about the purported artists, along with, for some of them, some comments on the paintings, but very little of the latter. This is true as you learn looking through both Japanese and Chinese reproduction books, true of most of them. The compilers too often choose the easy way out, printing the well-known information about the artists, which is available in any artist's dictionary, instead of writing anything really informative and perceptive about the paintings, as we'd like them to do. Okay, now I don't have the original slide of this first leaf, or if I did, I've lost it. So I'll show leaves for which I don't have the original slide images more briefly, identify the pictures, perhaps comment briefly on them, go on to the next, for all 60. The painting in this case is of a kind familiar to us, a fan-shaped album leaf depicting a sparrow perched on a branch of blossoming plum. There's no signature or seal. The attribution to the Emperor Huizong is purely conventional. There's no way of dating the painting from the woodblock printed reproduction, which doesn't transmit anything of brush drawing or nuances of tonality and so on. And the same will be true of many of the leaves for which I have no original images, nor show, as I say, only more briefly. The next, please. Leaf two uh, represents waves on the water. Uh, with the moon appearing over the uh, river or lakeshore in the distance. A striking composition ascribed for no apparent reason to the early Yuan master Yen Hui, who is best known for painting Buddhist and Taoist figures. This one lets us see how much color this artist uses. On the yellow moon, his blue-green distant bank, his wave with touches of white at the crest. The next, please. Leaf three, reproduced in black and white, old collotype, uh, represents two quail with a flowering plant and a butterfly above. The attribution to this late Northern Song Academy master, Leon Jung, is again conventional. Pictures of quail were associated with him because of his fondness for the subject. This color image of the leaf shows it to be a pretty good picture of quail, but not up to the really old and fine ones that I'll show next. The quail are flat and not endowed with a real sense of life as they are in the great early paintings. One of them is watching a white butterfly. Next. I showed several paintings of quail back in lecture 10b in discussing this artist. This is a fan painting in a Japanese collection ascribed to him, one of the best, quite possibly by him. Next. This is a painting of quail and Narcissus with a fake imperial seal and an attribution to Emperor Huizong himself, the emperor under whom Leon Zhong served. Next, please. And here's a detail from another quail painting preserved in Japan, where paintings of this subject were popular. Quail paintings were no doubt equally popular in China at the time of their production and for a while afterwards. But like so much else of Sogenga, they were considered too popular and too low class to be worthy of collecting by refined connoisseurs and so forth. You know all that. This one is close to the quail to the quail and the hikoen leaf, with a compact body covered with sharp quills. The next, please. The cover pages sometimes list two or three paintings, all ascribed to the same artist. This one, uh, which is for hikoen leaves four and five, uh, lists the landscape and a picture of herons, herons by the stream, supposed to be by Xiao Gui. For these, I do have good images, slide images, and I'll show them. The notes following each of the Japanese titles gives the materials, ink on silk, uh, ink and colors on paper, and so on, and the size, as I said. The woodblock reproduction flattens out the landscape. Next, please. But the image made from my old slide reveals more. I have to caution again, however, that I make no claims for these images uh, being true to the originals for any kind of visual truthfulness. They are heavily doctored from dark slides to make the designs more visible. This one bears a Shagwe signature, written oddly, in the lower left just below the riverbank. It's a strange place for Shagwe to have signed his painting, 
But the painting itself, as well as we can see it here, looks as though it has a real chance of being his work. The grove of leafy trees with a few branches protruding above them. A boat moored on the shore on the lower left. The rooftop seen to the left. The hilltop above. All these seem acceptable as from Chagwe's hand. Uh, note that this leaf has suffered damage from rolling in both directions, with cracking both horizontal and vertical, that is. It must have been mounted at different times in a hand scroll and in a hanging scroll before being put in this album. The next, please. Hikoen leaf 5 is fan-shaped and depicts two herons by a rushing stream with reeds growing beside it and a rock in the foreground. The painting appears old and fine, with a sense of strong wind nicely caught in the blowing reeds and the postures of the birds facing into the wind. The foreground rock seems acceptable as Chagwe's style and possibly from his hand. Um, the darkened sky is subtly done, as in Chagwe's reliable works. This one deserves to be taken seriously as possibly belonging within his oeuvre, his body of reliable surviving works. But it might very well be done by some close follower. The next, please. The, um, the next cover sheet is another one that applies to two paintings, both attributed to the early Yuan artist Chen Shiren. His is another name that is often attached to paintings in Japan as well as in China, although there is a question whether any of his paintings survived in Japan, at least among early imports. Wen Fong bought a small painting of a sparrow for the Princeton Art Museum with Chen Chuan's seal on it long ago, which he argued uh, was genuine, and maybe it is. It's a good purchase anyway. Um, the first of two pictures ascribed to Chen Chuan on the Hiko album, Hiko N album seen here, has an entertaining theme, a big rap, and several smaller ones, or mice maybe, eating a melon. Next, please. And here is the image made for my slide. The big rat has hollowed out the melon and occupies the space inside it, his tail protruding from the top, his head busily eating, seen through the front. The smaller animals are busy eating the seeds and other parts outside on the ground. Lots of melon seeds are shown on the surface of the inside. I have no idea about the origin or the significance of this theme. It has an obvious anecdotal attraction, lots of fun to look at but may symbolize something larger. There, the book readers can help by finding references to this theme in various texts and helping, to, uh, helping us to understand why such paintings were done. Next, please. The seventh Hikoen leaf, of which I have no slide, depicts three children playing some game on a mat laid out in the garden with a garden rock and a banana palm, a banana plant behind them. This one belongs to a familiar type, I showed a number of examples in one of my lectures, such as the uh, painting, the fan-shaped painting at the right, uh, which also depicts three boys playing in the garden with a garden rock and another plant behind them. These must have been done by specialist, specialist artists to supply an endless demand for entertaining pictures of this popular subject. And as I've said many times, they offer an opportunity for some scholar with sharp eyes and good textual knowledge to write about children's games in Sun Yuan times. I've been recommending that for years, but nobody has taken up my suggestion. Young scholars take note. Later I found my old slide of the hole, so we can now see it in color. The rock is bright blue, the banana palm and differing shades of green. The carpet on which the boys sit is an odd design with white spots against what must be a figured ground. The new image brings me no closer to being able to say what game the boys are playing. That'll have to wait for a special study. But pictures like this provide valuable materials that would enable such a study. Next, the cover sheet that follows for Hiko in 8 and 9 again attributes the paintings to a famous master, this time none other than Ma Yuan. Uh, leaf 8 is typical of works by him and his followers, depicting a man seated at the edge of his garden, as the railing indicates, gazing off at the moon, with a blossoming plum tree occupying his nearer vision, and bamboo growing above him and behind him. Next, please. For this, I do have a good slide image, which tells us more. 
that it's a relatively early work of high quality, possibly by Mahayana himself, or at any rate by an early, uh, early follower. The plum tree is not stiffened into the angular forms that we see in later imitations, and the spaces are readable, including the low fog and the hollow before him. The accompanying text identifies the image as the Sung poet Lin He Jing, but this is another standard association based on subject. Lin He Jing was fond of blossoming plum trees and wrote poems about them. The white dots representing plum blossoms effectively stand out against the darker ground. This might be taken, like the his son Ma Lin sitting up by lamplight, to represent that sense of the evanescence of beauty that keeps lovers of blossoming plants up late, gazing at them into the night. Next, please. This newly found detail reduces somewhat my previous estimate of the age of the painting and its closeness to Ma Yuan. It reveals some clumsiness in the drawing of the tree, especially the way a branch of it grows backward from it, and the flatness of the figure, no sense of volume beneath the white shape. Still, it takes its place among the many pictures of this type as an old and respectable addition. Next. The other painting ascribed to Mayuran, Leaf 9, is fan-shaped and is another night or evening scene, with our noble scholar here seen in a boat among reeds at the shore, leaning on his arm, the handle of his oar beneath it, things to eat and drink spread out on the seat before him an oddly shaped object with a pointed top that I can't identify as also there. Maybe it's some kind of wine gourd. More reeds and bare shoots of trees are seen across from him. Nothing in this one associates, associates it with Ma Yuan, at least for me. It appears to be a fine Sung Yuan painting by an unidentified artist, adding still another theme to the many of this type, representing scholar gentlemen enjoying scenes and situations in natural settings. The next, please. For this one, too, a detail helps to identify the object beside the man. It is a gourd, used for carrying wine. Its shape, its mottled surface, and its top identify it. I remember very well the trouble I had finding a real drinking gourd to take to Max Lohr's 70th birthday party to present to him, filled with Chinese wine, along with a speech telling how I had some difficulty obtaining it from a Taoist immortal. Difficulty because immortals, more or less by definition, don't die and relinquish their, their wine gourds. Old memories. The tenth leaf is ascribed to Ma Kui, who was the fourth in the Ma family lineage within the Southern Sioux Academy and Ma Yuan's brother. The attribution is probably again arbitrary. Quite a few fine Sung Yuan paintings are ascribed to him, to Ma Kui. They are listed in my index, where this one is called 14th century by a follower of Xiao Gui. Next, please. The reason for that attribution, which still seems right to me, that is, uh, a follower of Xiao Gui, can be seen if we put it beside uh, the signed Xiao Gui painting in the Palace Museum, Beijing, which is similar in theme and in composition. In both of them, a path enters from the lower left corner and continues beneath leafy trees, with the figure seen walking on it and approaching a house at the, on the water's edge, with the usual hilltop seen above. The Hiko An leaf could even be a distant copy, several times removed from the original, of the Beijing leaf. In any case, I have no slide image of it, or I lost it. Next, please. The eleventh leaf has a crazy attribution to the Tang period master Dai Yi, younger brother of the more famous Dai Sung. Both of them were specialists in painting water buffalo, and much later paintings of that subject were sometimes ascribed to them purely for their subject. The painting seems to be late Sung in date. Next, please. Fortunately, I do have a slide image of this one, and it reveals more. A large collector's seal at the top, as noted by the compilers of the reproduction volume, might be identifiable and could provide a clue to the transmission of the painting. Uh, painted in ink and colors on silk, this one is marked with strong horizontal cracking, indicating that it was once mounted, mounted in hanging scroll form. We can imagine the original compiler of the Hiko An album collecting 60 small paintings in various forms and states of preservation 
and mounting them all together in an album with a new title. The theme of this one, Buffalo and Herd Boys in a Landscape with Trees, is familiar to us from my long section on them in, lecture, in the Lecture 9 series, along with paintings of fish. We'll see one of those also later in the album. Next, please. Here, just to remind you, is one of the one of the ones that I showed, depicting a herd boy and two buffalo in a wintry landscape. The Hikoen leaf, with its greenery, suggests that the scenery is spring. I don't need to go over again the associations of the theme, political and other, since I talked so much about it back in Lecture 9. Next, please. The 12th and 13th leaves in the album are fan-shaped leaves with figures of palace ladies with their attendants and children. The attribution to Liu Sun Nian, an artist I introduced in one of my lectures with pictures of Arhats, is entirely arbitrary, can be forgotten. In both leaves, the ladies are in the garden. In one of them, the woman arises to stretch from a table where she's been doing embroidery or some kind of sewing. In the other one, the lady is drying her hands after bathing her child in the outdoor tub. Next. Here are the images made from old slides. Pictures of this kind of subject were done by such early masters as Zhou Fang in the Tang and Zhou Wanju in the Five Dynasties, as you remember, uh, in the Southern Tang. Uh, we know the subjects and the compositions of their paintings, uh, even though none of them survive, from later copies, which were very popular. Next, please. In the collection of the Freer, Freer Gallery, for instance, is this pair, ascribed to Zhou Wanju, but really fine Southern Song works. I reproduced both of them in, my, in color in my Chinese album leaves book. Their subjects are similar, palace ladies bathing children, standing with attendants. In this case, one of them takes a cup of tea from a tray held by a servant. Paintings of this kind were popular in Japan as well as in China for the glimpses that they seem to provide of life in the women's quarters of the imperial palace where no outsiders could ever penetrate unless, of course, they were emasculated and served there as eunuchs. We wouldn't, wouldn't want that. Next, please. Um, back to the two Hikoen leaves. Uh, these two are worthy addition to this group and could be around the same time and date, Southern Sung. Although they belong more likely in the Yuan, paintings of this kind are difficult to date. The flat, repetitive painting of the tree foliage in one of them would seem to indicate a post-Sung date. Next, please. Leaf 14 is attributed for no apparent reason to a Southern Sung artist named Chun Hung, or Chun Zishan, who is the younger brother or the nephew of the more famous Chun Rung, the well-known painter of dragons. And we can disregard the attribution and see this as another of our small paintings of commonplace subjects. Next, please. In this case, bunches of dark and white grapes, melons of some kind, and a curious red fruit all arranged in, on leaves in a basket, of which we see only the handle curving up and around them. Next, please. This belongs in the same group as the paintings of collections of shells arranged on pieces of green cloth that I showed in earlier lectures, speaking of them as representing types of paintings that must have been produced in large numbers for sale, cheap, to people visiting certain places associated with the subjects a seaside town for shells, perhaps. I related how an artist and art historian in Serbia named Dusan Pajin wrote me attaching an image that he had copied from an old book of a shell painting like these, suggesting that if the painting is indeed dated to the Sung period, as it was labeled, it might be the first still life painting in history. Ha ha, I wrote him back commending him on his observation and attaching these better images, but telling him that the painting he had found was one of a type that must have been done not as the solitary creation by some brilliant artist working in a studio, but as one of the hundreds or thousands done by minor specialty artists who sold them. Next. Sold them in busy markets like the one portrayed in this painting, a section of an anonymous scroll, probably 18th century in date, representing scenes in some village. Here, a busy market with stalls selling everything that one might desire, besides things to eat and medical treatments for your ailments, all set in a noisy bustle with kettle sellers and popular entertainers. This, I think, is the proper setting for such paintings, and it supplies the reason, of course, why they were scorned 
by serious collectors in China, just as the folk paintings called Otsue were scorned by serious painting collectors in Japan. We need, that is, to adjust our thinking about paintings of this kind without in any way putting them down or losing interest in them. The 15th Hikoen leaf is attributed, again without solid basis, to the early Song master Guo Zhongshu, who was famous for architectural paintings and for doing a copy of Wang Wei's Wang Chuan Villa compositions. Next, please. The fan shaped painting is probably late Song date, and it represents a water wheel under willows, powered by an ox who plods endlessly around, watched by a boy, to raise water for irrigating the fields, all under a thatched roof that shelters them from the rain. Uh, this must have been a common sight for visitors to the countryside, and quite a few pictures of it are preserved from Song times and later. They may have carried some political significance, such as encouraging agricultural pursuits. Next, please. Leaves 16 and 17, again with a single cover sheet because they're attributed to the same artist, are interestingly by an otherwise unknown Ming artist named Zhao Fu, who signs both of them. We can imagine him, we know nothing about him, but we can imagine him as a minor uh, Ming painter, too obscure to be recorded in the artist dictionaries, who specialized in making close copies or imitations of old paintings. These are late Sung in style, even though they're Ming in date. Next. This one represents sheep, or maybe goats, since they have horns. The Chinese don't differentiate clearly. In a landscape setting, a subject we haven't seen before, although there are numbers of examples by Sung artists, and a famous sheep and goat painting by Zhao Meng Fu in the early Yuan. The animals here are seen on a riverbank, several of them, including a lamb or goatlet, approaching the water to drink. The white billy goat looks up into the tree as if searching for something to eat. Zhao Fu's signature and seal are in the upper right. Next, please. Zhao Fu's signature on the other leaf includes a title that identifies him as a court artist in the Xuanda era, 1426 to 36. He must have specialized in producing close copies or imitations of Sung Academy paintings by artists such as Mao Yi, whose paintings these resemble. This picture of two dogs with a garden rock and flowering bush surely reminds us of paintings associated with Mao Yi, such as, next please, this picture of a mother dog and four puppies, which I showed and talked about at the end of Lecture 9C, or, next please, this one, ascribed to Mao Yi and in a Kyoto private collection, which I showed with it, suggesting facetiously that this was the father of the puppies. All of these will please dog lovers. Some of you will have noticed that the cover sheet titles, titles, for, this, titles for this leaf um, call it the Shaggy Dogs. That opens the way for me to begin telling Shaggy Dog stories, but I'll refrain from doing that. Next. Leaves 18 and 19 are also attributed to a Ming artist, this time the more famous Chu Ying, active in Suzhou in the early 16th century, an artist everybody knows. But, as all students of Ming painting know, also, his name was attached freely to a great many paintings in the so-called professional manner, and the attribution has little significance. Next. Leaf 18, seen here in a good slide image, depicts some rich person's villa, viewed from a distance, with a walkway stretching horizontally across the bottom, and low hills beyond on the horizon. Some of the occupants of the villa are seen through open doorways. The buildings are all set on a flat platform surface built up about a person's height above the ground, on a base that surfaced with stones. The tops of garden rocks and bushes are seen in the foreground. This is the kind of picture that might be of interest to architectural historians since it suggests the layout for an ideal residence for a rich and powerful Ming official, or maybe a member of the landed gentry. Close-in details permit us to see the people through the open spaces created by these sliding panels that open from the rooms onto the veranda. I'm familiar with this kind of construction in Japanese houses, but not in Chinese, but here it is. Uh, in upper left, a servant is seen through one of these preparing warm drinks, presumably. In the lower right, a man and a boy bend over a board. 
probably playing Wei Chi or some other board game. A screen with calligraphy is behind them. And through the open main entrance at center top, we see the host and a guest sitting facing each other with smaller figures, presumably family members and servants around them, and another larger calligraphy screen behind them. We can even make out the tall blue vase with flowers on the table behind, beside them. Next, please. Many other paintings of architectural scenes could make up a body of such work. This is one in the Freer Gallery. Uh, this is still another category in which the great surviving body of Sung Academy paintings, and later works in that style, make up a potentially analyzable data bank for future research. A potential is to be realized in the future if our culture survives that long. Next, please. Next. Hikoan Leaf 19, also ascribed to Chu Ying, again without basis, is another fan-shaped leaf in the Sung Academy style, this time representing a more interesting subject, two boats drawn up on the river shore in the evening. A family is traveling somewhere by boat along the rivers and canals that connected towns and cities in this prosperous Jiangnan region of China, we can suppose. And they have moored on the river bank in the evening to rest and eat and drink before sleeping. The man in the further boat looks toward his wife in the nearer one. Behind him is a female servant or perhaps a concubine. Several of their children are seen between curtains in the nearer boat. The mother sits motionless, her hands folded, looking forward, expressing as always her quiet acceptance of her situation of inequality, such at least is my modern interpretation of their relationship, no doubt very different from what the artist intended. Uh, what I'm trying to stress is the little noted value of these pictures in supplying sheer visual information on many issues that concern people who may have very little interest in painting as art. Next, please. The 20th leaf in the album is attributed to another Southern Sung Academy master, Li Sung, best known for super detailed figure paintings. The subject here, not one in which he specialized, so the attribution is again more or less meaningless, is another scene of a water wheel powered by a buffalo drawing up water for irrigation. The next, please. This one includes a buffalo calf in upper right, waiting, we are supposed, for its mother to finish work and be available for companionship and perhaps dinner. An earlier leaf, leaf 15, ascribed to Guo Zhong Shu, uh, bring that back, please, represented more or less the same subject with a richer setting of leafy trees. Again, these could be of interest to some historians, interested in agricultural technology, perhaps, or to art historians concerned with subjects represented by academy masters that carried particular political and other messages. Next. The 21st leaf is a painting of fish ascribed to the Sung artist Lai An, who, as I said in my discussion of fish paintings in Lecture 9b, was one of four Sung period painters of fish to whom surviving works are attributed, without much distinction in style between them, so far as I can see, or much evidence for any of the attributions. The next. This one is so much like the others that I really have nothing much to say about it. If you want to hear me talk at great length about Sung and Sung style fish paintings, go back to Lecture 9b. I will only note again that the horizontal cracking indicates that it was mounted before in a hanging scroll. Next, please. Leaf 22 supplies what we've been missing up to now, a painting of cat and kittens in a garden to go with the dog paintings. This one is attributed to Mao Sung, the father of Mao Yi, and the artist to whom the great monkey painting, also in the Tokyo National Museum, is attributed. Why the, why the printed title is Musk Cats, I have no idea, because I don't know, and I certainly haven't bothered to look up what a musk cat is. Anyway, the next, please. The painting proves to be a copy, perhaps several times removed, of the much finer one, ascribed to Mao Yi in the Yamato Bunkakan in Japan. The positions of the mother cat and the kittens have been rearranged, and the garden rock and the flowering plants move from right to left. This pairing provides us with another example of the great difference between a really fine Sung Period Academy painting 
and a pretty good later copy. Next. Leaf 23 is a painting of a blossoming plum branch ascribed, according to the accompanying text, to a Ming artist otherwise unknown, at least to me, named Zhang Yo, who it says was given a high rank in 1458 and did plum blossom paintings in the tradition of the great Yuan period master Wang Mian. Next, please. Here is the painting in the image made from my slide. It appears to be a fine, small painting of this type, but very much like hundreds of other paintings uh, of the type, to my eye at least. And I have nothing really to say about this subject, which has been thoroughly explored by others, notably by Maggie Bickford in her excellent 1985 book, Bones of Jade, Souls of Ice, colon, The Flowering Plum in Chinese Art, which was also the catalog of an exhibition of paintings of this subject. Next, please. Much the same is true of Leaf 24, which represents a Chinese orchid plant, Lan Hua, growing from an earth bank. It's ascribed predictably to another specialist artist, Shui Zhuang, or Pu Ming of the Yuan period, a Buddhist monk painter active in the 1340s to 50s. Quite a few of his paintings survive. Zhu Jing Li wrote an article about one of them, which is published in Archives of Asian Art, number 16 for 1962, in case you want to look it up. Next, please. Leaf 25 is another of a specialty plant subject by a Ming artist, carrying on an older tradition. This painting of grapes is attributed, for no discernible reason, to a Ming monk painter named Xiao An, who specialized in the subject, according to the accompanying text. Next. Uh, he's a close follower, of course, of the most famous of all painters of grapes, the late Song monk artist Wan Ruguan. I showed one of his works, an especially, an especially fine one with his signature and seals, now in our Berkeley Art Museum, near the end of Lecture 12D, I think it was. This is another lesser picture ascribed to him, closer in composition to the Hikoan leaf. This one adds insects to the grape clusters and leaves. And again, I have nothing special to say about them. Next, please. The 26th leaf represents tall stalks of bamboo growing beside rocks, along with ground vegetation. Three seals of the artist are stamped along its right edge and identify the artist, who is otherwise unknown, as a certain Rung Yang, presumably of the Yuan period. Next, please. This is one of which I did make a slide, presumably because the subject is more interesting. Pictures of this kind are mostly attributed to a certain Tanjiro Rui. There's a later leaf in the album, Leaf 43, which is attributed to him, and I'll talk more about the type and about him when we come to that. A number of artists working in the Zhejiang region in the Yuan period, another one is Guan Daosheng, the wife of Zhao Meng Fu, uh, painted pictures of tall bamboo in this manner, but virtually all examples have disappeared in China, excepting a few of them associated with Guan Daosheng because of her more prestigious association with Zhao, and most of them survive only in Japan. Two details reveals that some kind of bluish color seems to have been applied to the rocks. It doesn't look right as part of the original painting, and it may well be a later addition, meant meant to make the lower part stronger. Another patch of this bluish color appears above. It's hard to make out the original appearance of the rocks behind these later additions, as I take them to be. The detail of the upper part is better preserved and shows us how the tall stalks of bamboo differ in ink tonality, with the stalk at right a deep black, the one at left slightly lighter, I think, and the one between them and further back, paler in tone. This way of creating depth in paintings of bamboo uses a device that I talked about also in relation to some late zone landscape paintings. Next, please. I showed this painting of tall bamboo, a work of the Tanjiro Rui type, in my lecture on the six persimmons of Mu Chi, as another example of the late zone manner of making a composition by repeating forms that differ only in graded ink values to give some depth to the group. The Rung Yang picture is another example of this, with one 
darkest stalk at the right, a slightly lighter one at the left, and one in pale ink, understood as behind, uh, between them. The next, please. Leaf number 27 is titled, Men Chattering. <laughs> the English, written by Japanese of that time, is endlessly amusing. And the leaf is attributed to no less a painter than Zhao Meng Fu, the great statesman artist active in the early Yuan period. Paintings of horses are frequently ascribed to him because they were his favorite subject, or one of his favorite subjects at least. But here it's a figure painting. Two seals purporting to be Zhao's are on the lower left, and they pretend to support the attribution. The next, please. The painting, of which I have a slide, represents three figures. It's odd that the accompanying text doesn't identify the subject, which is clear to anybody who's familiar with old Chinese narrative paintings. It represents the fisherman from the Peach Blossom Spring legend, who made his way through a cave or a narrow opening into a hidden valley to find people living apart from the world in peace and harmony. Then he left and he could never find it again. Famous story. Uh, this is from the scene in which he first meets the vill village elders in the valley, still holding his oar under his arm. Whether this is from a series of paintings illustrating the story, or was cut from a hand scroll, or simply a solitary picture of this theme, uh, can't easily be determined. Next. A detail of the heads of the figures among the newly found images uh, shows how the artist has created the fisherman's excitement at meeting these elders and how their and their excitement in encountering this intruder from the outside world. In another context, their expressions might be seen as crafty or mendacious, but that probably isn't the artist's intention here. I don't know what the fisherman is conveying by holding his hand out with thumb and forefinger together, the other three fingers sticking up. A sign for money, perhaps. Someone else will know the answer to that. Next. I should add that a figure painting by Yosa Busson, the great Japanese Nanga poet painter, exists that is clearly based on this leaf, painted in 1781 as one of a pair. Uh, it has only reversed the figures. Whether Busson knew this album leaf or a larger painting from which it was cut is again unclear. Next, please. The accompany, accompanying painting, the other of Busson's pair, is of more of the village people coming to welcome the fishermen as a new arrival from the outside world. Whether, as I say, Busson copied one of his pair from the same source as the Hikkoen leaf, or whether a companion leaf existed that's now lost, is a matter for research that I leave for somebody else to carry out. Next, please. I simply call it all to your attention. Next, please. Leaf 28 is a picture of a bamboo branch painted in the ink on silk and attributed to the early Ming artist Xiao Chang, famous artist, specialist in bamboo. The accompanying text here gives only biographical information about him and provides no basis for the attribution, which would appear to be arbitrary, like most of these. Next, please. Dimly visible in the upper right is an oval seal, perhaps two seals, which may be those of Xiao Chang. In any case, this is a fine but conventional bamboo painting, or so it appears to me. If it has distinctive features that associate it with Xiao Chang, they escape my eye. Next, please. The 29th leaf, of which I have no slide, represents a bird hanging on a tree branch, turned upside down and with its beak open as if it's chattering. Someone else can probably identify the bird. The execution of the painting in quick, somewhat disconnected brushstrokes indicates the hand of a highly trained artist. And Lin Liang, who served in the Ming court as a court painter, is a real possibility. Next, please. A somewhat similar painting by the middle Ming Suzhou master Tang Yin, reproduced as figures 99 to 100 in my Parting at the Shore book, uses the same kind of brilliantly fast, disconnected brushstrokes to depict a singing bird on a branch. I'm not suggesting an attribution of the Hiko and leaf to Tong Yin, but I'm simply pointing out what a highly trained Ming master could do when he relaxed his hand without lessening its representational power. 
I should have made a slide of the Hiko and leaf. Next, please. The 30th leaf and the last that we're going to be looking at in this first part of my Hiko and lecture is ascribed to a minor Yuan period artist named Shun Meng Jian, who is a pupil of Chen Shren. This is, so far as I know, the only extant painting associated with him. It represents butterflies attracted by a peony in full bloom. I have no slide of it, so I have no way of knowing and no remembrance of the color of the peony. Is it white? Is it pink? I don't know. But I'll use it to talk about peony paintings in the Sungran period, showing a number of them in images that I've made from old slides. The next, please. This image of the whole painting, among the new ones, reveals better the real quality of the painting, which is lower than I thought at first. Uh, the strokes for the branch don't have much energy behind them, and those that make up the bird fail to pull together to give it a rounded, organic body. The painting may in fact be a copy after something better. When I put it beside the truly great image by Tong Yin in a moment, uh, you'll see immediately the difference, how even the disconnected strokes for Tong Yin's branch uh, sh uh, sh uh, show it as a continuous and receding form, how the bird is full of vital energy. So next, please. This one, first of all, is one I've shown before, a fan painting in the Palace Museum in Beijing with an odd, old, meaningless attribution to Xu Shi. It has seals of the great collector Liang Qingbiao on it. He was presumably impressed by the Xu Shi attribution more than by the visual appeal of the flower. I should have made clear early on that I don't mean to imply in saying that the paintings in this album belong to my category of Sogenga, uh, to imply that they are all of types that were scorned and not collected by Chinese collectors, so that they survive only in Japan. Some of them, especially if they are ascribed to old masters, were indeed collected in China also. My point is only that the Kikkoen paintings include many types that are preserved only in Japan, or nearly so, and do belong to this Sogenga type. The attraction of peony paintings on a popular level is obvious. They were symbols of wealth and luxury, and they had certain sexual implications. The next, please. As seen in this lush picture, which is reproduced as figure 510, 5.10 in my Pictures for Use in Pleasure book, my recent book, a picture of a scholar and beauty pair sitting in a garden surrounded by huge peonies, very symbolic indeed, sexy. But colorful pictures of peonies alone also abound. Next, please. I showed these two near the end of Lecture 10. They are works by some anonymous artist of the Piling School, located in present-day Zhenjiang, southeast of Nanjing, where a school of specialists in flower and insect paintings flourished for centuries. I mentioned that there's an article on the school by Shujiro Shimada. Next, please. I'm showing without identifying them or commenting on them some slides I made in old days in Japan of peony paintings owned by two dealers, Yabumoto Sogoro in Amagasaki and Heizondo in Tokyo. Uh, there's not much one can say about them. They would be fine, fine decorative pieces to hang on one's wall or in one's tokonoma, and they carried, as I say, auspicious symbolism besides. Paintings of this kind were definitely scorned by Chinese collectors but they were no doubt used decoratively in houses all over China at the same time. We need to remember always that paintings of the kind valued by collectors in China, the kind that we think of as constituting Chinese painting as we study it and collect it in our museums, makes up only a part and a small part of what was actually produced. And as many of you know, I've been trying for a long time now to direct more attention to all those kinds that are outside the wall, so to speak. Next, toward the end of Lecture 10b, I showed also details from a long hand scroll titled 100 Flowers in the Palace Museum in Beijing, which has been published by them in a complete set of plates and is much admired, depicting flowers in ink only, done by some non anonymous late songmaster. And I pointed out that this is what the literati were supposed to prefer. I quoted Alexander Soper, writing in his article on 
Standards of Quality in Northern Sung Painting, which is published in Archives No. 11 for 1957, Soper is saying that the somewhat moralistic arguments of the scholar critics against rich color and decorative styles put painters in the paradoxical position of being constrained from capturing in their paintings the very qualities that constitute the real nature of flowers as they are normally perceived. Subtleties of color, graceful rhythms of contour in the leaves and petals, close differentiation of species by careful observation and depiction of distinguishing details. Even as these painters were being enjoined to pursue the inner essence of their subjects instead of their outer appearances, this anomaly of critical theory, I concluded, certainly affected the development of bird and flower painting in later centuries in China. It was never to regain the heights that it had achieved in the Sung. Next. Finally for this lecture, this pair, the cover of my first book again, with the detail on it from the painting of pink hibiscus that we saw along with its pair, the other one of the pair that is, depicting white hibiscus, in Lecture 9C. These are works by the Southern Sung Academy Master Li Di, painted in 1197. And Color Plate 18 in that little book, a section of a painting of peonies in the Koto in Kyoto, uh, the temple called the Koto in in Kyoto, with a meaningless attribution to Chen Xuan. And I'll read now what I wrote about that latter painting, which still rings true to me. Here we go. This is what I wrote about the Chen Xuan peonies. If I can read it, yes. This painting, unlike the previous one, has nothing to do with Chen Xuan at all. It is, in fact, exactly the kind of picture toward which the Yuan Dynasty uh, literati painters and critics, of whom Chen Xuan was one, directed their scorn. A quatrain attributed to another scholar painter of the time, for example, it's Wu Zhun, by the way, um, somewhat advises somewhat caustically that if an artist wants to, quote, please his neighbor's eyes, he has only to, quote, buy a lot of vermilion paint and do peonies for them. But the professionals, specialists in flowers and other popular subjects, whose vocation it was to paint such pictures as this one, went right on doing so. And there is no indication that the disapproval of the literati caused any falling off in their sales. The branches and leaves are drawn in outline with washes of green filled in. The flowers are done in the boneless manner without outlines. The shading from heavy to lighter color in the petals, a technique closer to the occidental handling of color than to the flat washes more common in China, gives to the blossoms an illusion of real three-dimensional existence, which is a bit at variance with the flat pattern treatment of the branches and leaves. But this is not disturbing. The picture as a whole is decoration of a high order. One can admire it as such while acknowledging that it is not on the same artistic level as the best Sung flower painting, which is much more than decoration. End of my quotation. Well, and with those words, which I think hold up pretty well considering that they were written more than half a century ago by a young writer still finding his style, with those words, I conclude this long lecture, part one of the two Hikoen lectures. Mm -hmm.